I think a lot of Chinese students feel scared and lonely. And I think it would be, um, is a disservice to them that they made it to come to the US to study, that they cannot enjoy the same freedoms that other people in this country have. Now, I am pleased to introduce our speaker for this evening. Maya Wang is a senior China researcher in the Asia Division at Human Rights Watch. Wang has researched and written extensively on the use of torture, arbitrary detention, human rights defenders, civil society, disability rights, and women's rights in China. She's also an expert on human rights in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. In recent years, her original research on China's use of technology for mass surveillance, including the use of biometrics, artificial intelligence, and big data has helped galvanize international attention on these developments in China and globally. Wang has published on major international media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, China File, The Diplomat, The Guardian, and has been frequently quoted by international media, including the New York Times, Reuters, Bloomberg News, and the Associated Press. Maya, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, Kyle. And yeah. it's a great pleasure to be uh, speaking with y'all and um, constructive engagement is also what we are for as well. Mm. It's great to hear. Yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to chatting and learning a lot tonight. So uh, really to, to dive in here, uh, could you share some, some general context to kind of get us started around the intellectual climate in China and in Hong Kong? Right. Um, well, I think it can be summed to have just uh, with, in one word is that it is really bad in China and also in Hong Kong. Um, well, um, I think that since the Chinese Communist Party came to power um, in 1949, basically, um, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, CCP, has been hostile to intellectuals. Um, and I'm sure we have seen, um, you have all seen images of how intellectuals were struggled against in um, the anti rightist movement in the 1950s and during periods like the Cultural Revolution, where um, people, intellectuals were um, persecuted to the extent that they were killed, um, they committed suicides, they were publicly humiliated, um, and their families and themselves were deprived of, you know, all kinds of uh, basic necessities, uh, not just, you know, life, but also, you know, housing and their jobs, obviously, um, because um, of their, of their uh, work, uh, because of the academic work. So that kind of sets a very, you know, um, down kind of basic tone. And, but on the other hand, um, throughout these last decades, there have been relative ups in kind of, in China when it comes to being, um, in academia. Um, you have the 1980s leading up before the Tiananmen massacre. Uh, the 1980s was a period of opening in China where intellectually people coming out from the Cultural Revolution were hungry for information um, and were very open-minded um, or were allowed to be open-minded. And then in early 2000, again, at the, with the advent of the internet, um, it was uh, a blossoming of ideas. Uh, and people are creative in pushing um, against the, the limits set by the government. But almost in every single case, when there is an opening, there is a tightening. And we are at this moment in time, a tightening under President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping, who has been uh, in power since 2013. And under him, um, there is deepening repression across China um, and in higher education as well. Um, professors in universities, of course, are long used to some form of self-censorship in China and censorship. And censorship. Um, but since 2013, I think the intellectual climate has really deteriorated very significantly. Uh, they are afraid of informants in, in, in the, sitting in the classes, um, their um, foreign links, and also you, you can just like being engaging with foreign ideas is um, that these kind of links and interactions with the foreign world are under greater scrutiny. Um, not to mention um, uh, there is of course internet harassment that is not just harassment on the digitally, but also actually led to people being fired um, and, you know, of course, being investigated um, by the police. Um, there is uh, a very well-known professor, uh, Sri Jiangren, who um, criticized presidency's elimination of the, of the third term for the presidency. 
um, he, the presidency essentially changed the constitution of China to allow to, to scrape the, the presidential term limits. And that actually, uh, Professor Xu, together with uh, some of the others, were one of the few voices that you know, spoke out against um, the, this uh, scraping of the presidential term limits. And for that, he was investigated, barred from teaching, arrested, and um, actually detained for six days for allegedly having solicited um, prostitutes. So you see the pattern, you see how much that academics not only lose their, their jobs, um, their reputation, um, they could be losing their pension or even face imprisonment for speaking out um, differently uh, from what the government uh, want them to say. Um, and then changing to Hong Kong, um, and I am sure a lot, in, a lot of um, the uh, people here in the audience uh, might have you know, exchange programs or interactions with Hong Kong University because I mean, after all, it is a relatively more international and open society for a very long time until 2020. I mean, the Chinese government has been tightening its grip over the city for some time, but since 2020, it decided to essentially employ the iron fist. And what that means is that um, because universities um, were the site of these major protests in 2019. So there are these big protests, I'm sure all of you can recall in Hong Kong in 2019. Uh, following these protests, the Chinese government clamped down on freedoms all across the board in Hong Kong, including on academia. And basically the uh, Chinese government has been embarking on a, quite a, a, an intensifying cleansing of um, universities, uh, purging academics that are pro-democracy. Um, many of them are just, you know, very moderate intellectuals that have been around for a very long time. Um, almost all the universities have taken action against student unions, essentially kicking them off campus and saying that we're not going to collect your membership dues, we're not going to give you a room, we're not going to administer the union, the union doesn't belong to the university. Um, and of course, uh, there has also been restricting, increasingly restrictive um, uh, environment for freedom of expression and in both in classrooms and on campus, um, as well as um, uh, it used, universities used to be places where people protest, right, like campus protests, how, how common are those? Um, but now people are um, arrested um, so there was uh, for, for protesting so one fairly recent case is when Chinese University of Hong Kong again a fairly high-ranking university globally and and also in Asia um, the students protested against the national security law um, uh, which was imposed in Hong Kong in 2020 which started this crackdown that we see in Hong Kong um, for protesting completely peacefully the university, Chinese University of Hong Kong called the police on the students. And now some of the students are facing um, uh, charges under the national security law, which is draconian, and with a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. So let, let us pause there to think that there are these students in the city of Hong Kong, which until very recently lived like they had lived in places throughout the US who have a lot of freedoms, and suddenly they have kind of go on the other side where they are now facing life imprisonment for protesting on campus. And I think that is really shocking. And I really want to discuss with you all about what US universities can do, because I think that um, I have, yeah, I, I'll pause right over there because I think um, I, I also want to hear from, from Kyle and also the others, um, what you think about that. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Maya. That's, that's, Man, there's lots to unpack there. I guess one, one question I have for you as someone who's watched this for a while, you mentioned tightenings and openings and you, you, something you said about, of course, when there's an opening, there's a tightening. In, in a sort of broader historical perspective, sort of two questions here. Have you noticed any, any uh, patterns in typically how long these tightenings and these openings happen? How far into it might we be? And does anything feel different about it this time around? I mean, we're, we're saying in the US that it feels different this time, that cancel culture and the chilling effect on campus is worse, that since 2015, something changed. Um, what's, your, what's your analysis of, of the contemporary moment in, in China and Hong Kong compared to prior decades? Um, well, I think I've been wait, we have all been waiting for kind of the light at the end of the tunnel for a very mm -hmm. long time. And, and like, you, like you know, we were talking about, 
um, as someone who's worked on China for well, you know, over 15 years, I um, we have I've experienced a number of you know these kind of tightening and opening, and also just people pushing against the boundaries, right? As soon as there is a bit of space, you know, society blossom in in free expression. Um, uh, but basically, since 2013, when President Xi came to power, there has not been kind of any opening. In fact, it's just been going more and more and more repressive and you must have seen what the COVID controls are like in places like Shanghai where um, just really arbitrary and of course you know people should have their health uh, right to health protected but um, they have to be in balance um, but what is happening in China is that the, the bureaucratic goals of the party trumps everything else and um, it doesn't matter if you're academic if you are jack ma who owns alibaba or if you are a resident of shanghai um, you are subjected to that kind of increasingly oppressive um, repression uh, from um, the chinese government so things are, are pretty grim yeah yeah uh, i'm gonna actually this is uh usually wait for questions at the end but there's a question here that's really salient to this moment uh Someone's asking or mentioning that when they were studying in Australia, they hosted visiting Chinese medical students. And I'm going to read this. I was explicitly told by one of our faculty not to ask them about Hong Kong. This was during protests shortly before the recent crackdowns. How, how can the CCP exert so much influence over academics who aren't in China? So could you speak for a moment to how this sort of creeps beyond China's borders? Yeah. Um, well, it, the world is really connected i guess it's a bit of a cliche to say that um but um in many ways you know you have chinese students living outside of china some of them are, are um supportive of the chinese government some of them are you know party members um and some of them are um does not support the chinese government um, and then you have scholars who are in that same kind of category. Some of them are more supportive and there's a whole range of, of opinions. However, um, because of the fact that people who support the government can rally the government to essentially harass fellow students um, through, you know, um, lots of these students, they may be abroad, but or the scholars, they may be abroad, but their parents and their entire family are back home. So what the Chinese government often does is that they harass the families and tell them to make sure their, their children or their brothers and sisters would stop talking or else they might lose their jobs and pensions or they may be detained, their passports taken away. I mean, these things all happen to people that I, I know of quite well. So um, that means that um, when they are abroad, students have to be very, very careful of what they say. And the ones who are disagreeing with the government simply just clam up because they know if they say anything, um, they would be reported back. Um, or, or that does just like a, a vague threat, right? Nobody wants to have that threat that could happen to your family. Um, and uh, because of that, um, I think their voices of the people who are very vehemently perhaps um, supportive of the government's abuses often get um, be to become uh, the loudest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. To, to dig in a little more on a, a topic that's just increasingly in American media, especially in the past year, uh, the, the, the Uyghur crisis. Uh, Obviously, it's broader than just intellectualism and, and education. There's, there's, a, there's a lot to say about the crisis. How, how do you see the Uyghur crisis playing into uh, the crackdown on, on free speech and, and free inquiry? Yeah, um, I'm glad that you mentioned the Uyghurs because um, what I described about the general environment of China and the general environment of Hong Kong doesn't even speak to the suffering of Uyghurs who are in academia. Um, essentially, since um, 2017, there has been a, a really severe um, crackdown going on in Xinjiang. Um, and that means um, we estimate that um, over a million um, Uyghurs and Turkic Muslims have been sent to these arbitrary detention facilities called political education camps. They are completely um, unlawful, no court hearing whatsoever. 
um, with the idea that these people are going to be held and um, indoctrinated to become kind of loyal, um, essentially loyal to the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, many more, uh, sorry, a, a significant proportion of these people are also sent to prison for a very long period of time. Um, again, with the idea that these people are disloyal to the party in, in some shape or form. And the, the disloyalty could consist of some very, very um, normal behavior, let's say. Uh, for example, if you use WhatsApp instead of WeChat, uh, if you have families in a, abroad, let's say a place like Turkey or um, Afghanistan, because of historical and cultural ties, because they, these Uyghurs of Turkey Muslims, they have families in these places, right? Mm -hmm. So very normal family relations are being criminalized, but not criminalized, I mean punished extra legally uh, if you are Uyghur. And these are all behavior protected that should be protected in the Chinese law, and yet they're being penalized for these behavior that is completely commonplace. And also nobody actually tells them that these things, often there's no kind of clear red line. Sometimes people are essentially taken off in the middle of the night to these places, to political education camps, or being put in, in um, prisons. Now, the reason that this background is important is that intellectuals who are Uyghurs bear the brunt of much of this crackdown. Um, the, the intellectuals um, essentially have been carted off to these camps and to these prisons. Um, uh, for example, the, the Uyghur economist Ilham Tati, uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, um, he has uh, been sentenced to life for separatism. Uh, Rahil Dawood, an expert on Uyghur folklore disappeared in 2017 and it's believed that she is in prison, though nobody knows for what and for how long. Um, and other uh, scholar, um, Nur Muhammad Tati, is, who is a math scholar and a writer, was sent to one of these political education camps and believed to have died in the camps. So these are just, you know, three, one of the most kind of um, names that you would hear um of intellectuals that gives you a sense of how severe the persecution is um and when you were talking about the past um sometimes i feel what is happening to uyghurs um echo uh you know the worst um excess of the chinese Communist party um, i think for the uyghurs they have been experiencing something um as um dire perhaps uh like you know the period of the cultural revolution even though the rest of china um uh, are relatively speaking maybe experiencing uh perhaps are not yet there but the question is are we going there and i think that is something that is very very um concerning given the in the overall repression that we are seeing all over the world i mean i think the world is also getting increasingly also returning mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's I think that's definitely a question that that want to approach in a little while about the directionality of sort of China, but of, of the US. Are we talking about a difference in degree or different difference in kind here with, with what we're experiencing? Uh, so actually, to, to, to if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to shift to cross borders sort of China US, um, you know, cultural back and forth here. Uh, Let's talk for a minute about what surveillance fears Chinese students and scholars grapple with. You've explained a bit about about at you know in China, but but also in the U.S. What does that really look like? We we already have some questions about about that about what students, even scholars, and on our campuses here in the U.S. Um, might be facing. What what does that look like for them day to day? Yeah, um, I share with you first this um, young woman I spoke with recently. Um, who is from the mainland. Um, she goes to a university in the East Coast uh, studying a fairly technical subject, nothing political science or sociology, like it's just very technical. And, and I get the feeling that many Chinese young people do choose technical subjects also because, you know, they're safer, like at least, you know, back home, right? So she's in a very kind of sciencey type of, of um, major. And this is what she does. She said the first time she arrived in this on this um, this university, um, she got this orientation email from the International Student Association of, of the campus, welcoming her and telling her that they are organizing this welcome orientation meeting um, together jointly for, for the Chinese students, together with um, the CSSA, the Chinese Student Scholar Association. 
Now, I don't know how many of you know the CSSA is um, it's a student organization, but at the same time, the, the association reports to the Chinese embassy. Um, it has a very close relationship with, with the embassy. So now the student, knowing that, doesn't want to go to this orientation and feel oppressed that she really wants to be, you know, getting to know other people, wanting to be welcome, but she's not going to go there. Now, that's just the orientation. What, what happens next is that she goes to class and she decided to change her name. So instead of appearing to be a mainland student, she is trying to hide to be some, some other East Asian country from another East Asian country. Hmm. She doesn't want to speak Chinese. She doesn't um, want to add to other students to her social media because she knows if she says she's Chinese, she, they would ask her for her WeChat, which means that they will be able to see what her, she has been posting. And that means that she would be kind of transparent, right? Like anyone who is from her home country, the whole of China could potentially be informing on her what she says in class. She also doesn't go, she also really does, doesn't talk at all, she said, in group exercises. Because if she says anything, she's also worried that that would be reported back to the, to the police. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that she's essentially kind of self ostracizing herself. Um, and it's not easy when you're young and you're in a different culture, you're speaking a different language. In order to maintain your political opinion as a political minority, she has to adopt all these measures. Luckily, she does find her friends who are, none of them are, are, are Chinese as far as I know, or, or most of them are not. Uh, but this is the extent to which these students have to go to in order to, to maintain their, um, their, their political opinions, which are in a, in a minority from their point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so what they fear is informants. What they fear is the CSSA. What they also fear is the Confucius Institute. Uh, for them, going to Confucius Institute events, which are these um, institutes are, you know, in universities and, and they provide Chinese language education, not just in universities, but in, you know, lower, in, in um, as I understand, in K-12 education in the U.S. Um, for them, I think often Confucius Institute, I mean, there's a lot of debate over, you know, do they censor, do they, are they subjected to Chinese government pressure? Um, human rights watch consider them to be um, kind of an extension of the Chinese government and we call on universities to essentially reject these institutes. Um, for these students, Confucius Institute is like this kind of carve out of a territory where they also fear going to the events because you know they, they know if they say anything at these events, they don't know who will be reporting on them again back home. And um, so, um, and the self-censorship doesn't just start um, stop at the students. I mean, there's also scholars, scholars who study China as well, who also practices um, self-censorship. Um, and um, in a survey, actually, um, uh, 500 um, scholars who study China, 70% says that they exercise some form of self-censorship because they worry that they can't go back to China to you know, pursue their academic um, work if they say anything critical of the Chinese government. And that basically means between the Confucius Institute and, um, and, uh, and the self-censorship of, of scholars who study China, um, essentially the production of knowledge on China in this country or you know, in the Western world is often held in the hands of the Chinese government, right? There's actually, um, because the Chinese government can essentially have this kind of fear that is spread across the scholarship that they can, the, the, the scholars quite consciously choose certain subjects that are relatively non-sensitive so that they can, you know, travel to China and do that kind of work. Uh, yeah. Do you, do you, uh, go, I have a couple questions. Um, <laughs> In your research and your observations, have you noted that the Chinese government has a better hold on student and scholar mentalities in the US as compared to England, France, Spain, Germany? Uh, or or is, it a, is, it a, is it a fairly tight lock, uh, you know, sort of across the Western world? It's a fairly tight lock. Um, the thing is, uh, the Chinese government's arm is really quite long, and uh, because of essentially everyone who's from China or the Greater China, including places like Hong Kong, feel that they have multiple hostages in the hands of the government, right? Mm. Um, and you, 
you can't escape that, even though I think physically speaking, um, one being in the, I think the US government has done, a, a, it was, is in, at least in prevention of harassment of people physically in the US by Chinese government agents, um, at least in high profile cases, I, I think it gives a sense of better um, security perhaps for, for those people. But again, that, that's just like one of many threats you have, you have to face. And I think for the students who are not high profile activists, a lot of things just go under the radar, right? Like they're not going to report to the FBI if um, if they, uh, you, you know, fear a fellow student informing on them or just any student. So I, I think a lot of them kind of are in the shadows and, and um, kind of fear and perhaps sometimes give up on actually expressing their views. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of a related question as, as, as we compare U.S. culture, uh, similar trends in U.S. culture and Chinese culture. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate in U.S. culture, and we're hosting one right now on our blog about the causes for self-censorship among students and sometimes scholars. And there's, there's discussion about to what extent that self-censorship is always motivated by a, by a direct fear or risk of being canceled, being, 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 you know, uh, drive before a jury of your peers, whatever it might be, and or that there are examples of that. It is real, but you only need a few of those to create a chilling effect for the for the rest, and that it's 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 viral, that it just causes this this sort of campus wide um, shutdown for for Chinese students without it at all deterring you know from the reality that that this is real, that they do need to be careful. How much is there also a chilling effect that is sort of assumed upon them because they they don't know whether or not they are actually potentially under watch and it's better to just keep keep quiet. I think definitely. I mean the the power of the party um, mm -hmm. and we have so many examples. Some of them really high profile, right? Like so. Um, I remember a university graduate. I think it was actually University of Maryland, but that was several years ago, and I don't remember very well. Um, who gave a speech um, at graduation, and she was picked for to give a speech because she was such an excellent student and she's from China. And at, at the time, I think it was during the Obama administration where she kind of compared, you know, the, 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 the lack of pollution here in the US to the pollution in China. Um, and it was just kind of perhaps innocuous comparison, right? Like any American would go out and say, well, compared to home, these are better or worse. Like you don't think about this. Um, and it was actually, a few years ago, so things have not gone so bad as this now, but um, this student, her recorded message, um, graduation message, was, um, you know, went viral in China and, um, you know, people criticized her for criticizing the government or, or criticizing pollution in China, which is a fact, right? The, at least at the time, pollution was really bad. And, and the Chinese government did, you know, clean up in certain areas, especially in cities and sun. Um, and so it's a factual statement. Um, and for having said that, I think she was essentially dragged through the coals on the internet, um, but, but also um, the harassment extended to, to her family back home. So events like this, which everybody would know, um, everybody would have in mind, keeps people in mind that they don't want to be that person who essentially disgraced their entire family, put them at risk. Um, and that disgrace is so so the so strong because one moment you could be the top of the class, right? Like the, the, the apple of your parents' eyes studying in a good university in the US. And then suddenly you're being essentially harassed by you know, half of the country back in your home. I, I think that is a very um, uh, difficult experience. I think seeing that for a lot of students. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it makes an impression. Um, just a quick reminder to, to everyone in the audience that we are taking questions. We already have a bunch of, of, of great ones that we'll be calling on soon, but uh, please feel free to, to ask away. We'll be looking at those pretty soon. Uh, Maya, to, to, keep delving into, into the US context here a little bit. Um, in addition to Chinese students and scholars facing fears and, and suspicions and, and, and you know, unsurety about, about their status in, in, you know, in China, uh, the last couple of years, 
there's been an uprising in the U.S. of real anti-Asian hate, partly generated from COVID uh, and, and some political rhetorics uh, and, and general suspicion of, of China. Uh, how are you seeing that also stifle self-expression when it seems like students are sort of caught, caught, caught in between here? Um, does that impact me students and scholars? And maybe as we slightly turn, start turning towards solutions here, how do, we, how do we combat that at least if we can't combat you know, the CCP from where we sit right now? <laughs> yeah, um, well, uh, yes, there have been a number in, of instances where um, that Chinese students have complained that other people criticizing the Chinese government particularly the abuses um, of Uyghurs, is that criticism itself incites anti-Asian hate. Now, let's pause for a minute here, is that um, in, at least in one case, the person who is um, criticizing the Chinese government is a Uyghur. So both the Chinese students and the Uyghur are actually Asians, right? Um, and, and, and so the idea, first of all, that you're criticizing a government is equivalent of promoting hatred against a racial group or, or a multitude of racial groups um, is, is, is quite ludicrous. And then on top of that, um, the well, first of all, the administration in, in a couple of cases were very quick to respond in that they immediately agree that that criticism of the Chinese government was um, that that um, was somewhat contributing to anti-Asian hate. Um, I might be mischaracterizing some of that response, but the first response was that, was agreeing with that, that they have to be very careful of anti-Asian hate, which I think, you know, um, it, it would have been better if the administration actually pause and ask for a minute, what's going on here? Um, I think the question there was that, that administrations these days are so jumpy um, about these accusations that they very immediately, it's the first response is to, you know, shut down the, the, the whole thing and apologize without even kind of seeing like what is happening here? What is being said? Is that actually hatred or is that criticism? And I think in, in, in this case, um, some of the administrations actually did reverse that that stands after understanding the issue, and of course, having been reported in the press. Um, so it seems to me that the jumpiness here is the part of the problem. Um, and I I would start by, also by by saying that um, the idea of Asian is at least I can say that uh, is a is a very broad one. Um, where um, it encompasses so many different groups, so many different um, relationships within, right? So within the whole of Asia, um, I think uh, there are not only different countries, but within uh, every country, there are sexual, um, uh, uh, racial, uh, socioeconomic diversity and discrimination within it. By saying the word Asian or just anti-Asian hate, it collapses the category label into one that essentially also could mask the oppression within. And I think this is where the problem here is that um, the use of that the, the term um, is unhelpful um, because both sides are actually Asians and that um, there is you know, the oppression directed at Uyghurs by Chinese um, government. Um, and then on top of that, um, I think that, um, so I think how we can address that is to, for the, for the administrators of university to, I, I, again, I can't speak to every single incident. And I think in many cases, there could be, you know, clear cases where it is um, hate crimes um, on campus uh, or a hateful speech. Uh, but in this case, I think it would be helpful if the university actually, first of all, understand that the, the whole of Asia is consists of many different groups of people, that there are many different power dynamics within them, and to prevent to provide that kind of thoughtful safe space for students, right? right. Um, and and the safe space is something that is difficult to achieve when it comes to the Chinese government. Like we were just discussing, mm -hmm. nowhere is really safe for the students. Um, as a result, actually, um, Human Rights Watch has a code of conduct for universities 
um, to exactly provide a safe space for students from China and Hong Kong, as well as scholars, and also anyone who study and speak on China. Um, so far, we take this code of conduct to universities, but unfortunately, you know, the US does have, you know, many universities and, and not, we can't take it to every single one of them. And there is also the problem that I think often administrators don't want to deal with it. Um, because, you know, um, China is also quite a lucrative market for students and exchanges and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, I really hope that uh, our audience will also become part of the um, people who can help us to, to change that situation on the campus simply by saying, well, what about this code of conduct? <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're fairly easy steps, um, as in, you know, I, from our opinion, is they are sensible steps that uh, say, for example, beware of group, you know, be, be considerate when you're assigning group work, um, making the option of an uh, anonymous submission of homework um, uh, an option, for example. So these are all steps that people can can take, universities can take, it's not impossible. Yeah, yeah. I actually have to dial right down into that because uh, one of our one of our questions is about that specifically. Um, also, there's there's a very long rabbit hole to go down. You used the, the phrase safe spaces, which uh, in in this context is is of course uh, suggesting protection and and uh, and liberation from from the watchful eye of of, a, of another nation state. And it's a phrase, as you know, that that is used in in uh, the states often campus to refer to uh, freedom from from harmful rhetoric and harmful rhetoric. And I think there's there's a lot to talk about uh, about relative relative modes of protection and and risk and and threat. Um, I think we're going to set that one aside for the moment because it's 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 complex and juicy. Uh, but you you started listing there things that universities can do. And one of our questions here is uh, I teach in a private art university. About 70% of my students are from mainland China. I'm not sure what the percentage is in the school as a whole, but it's high in my department. Is there anything I can do to help my students beyond maintaining a classroom environment of free inquiry and personal expression? Um, oh, I think that's a great start. I think if you can do that um, for the students, that would be a really important start. However, um, I would also think through if it is really a genuine free space, right? Because if, even among the students who come to the US, um, there are many different opinions and whether or not somebody who keeps quiet, like I was saying, uh, are they really quiet or are they just afraid? I think that's a different um, category and it re requires some kind of probing, at, at least in, in a way that's sensitive. Um, I think beyond that, um, it would be important to, to discuss with the students what they think about these issues, right? Gently, again, keeping in mind that some people would be afraid to, to discuss these issues. Hmm. Um, and then, um, you know, um, I also wonder about what you were saying, Kyle, that what the safe space means. Uh, like, for example, um, should we all be recording all our um, classes or I don't know now that COVID is is better on campuses, whether or not people are still recording classes and lectures and tuning in online. Mm -hmm. But you know, having things said in a particular context, in a particular time and space, you know, in our head space, in our it spaces interacting with particular groups of people sure. can be taken completely out of context in some situations. Hmm. Um, and um, whether we should continue to record these conversations or should there be, you know, you're talking about some level of threats and risk may be okay and some level of are to be taken and some level of risk are higher. And I think maybe according to these different levels, we can think of different ways. So, so some of the most sensitive conversations are under Chatham House rules, right? Like in, in, in meetings and so on. Sure, sure. Um, and we may have to think of, you know, in some conversations they are difficult and, um, and they should not live on the internet forever. Um, mm -hmm. To be used 20 years later, uh, where someone has grown and developed and thought things through very differently in life. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a that's a question right now. Uh, certainly, as we experience COVID and we're all sort of sent home and exposed on social media and the internet to just a vast a vastness of opinions and beliefs and 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 events and things. And that question of of uh, 
how much is a human being meant to, meant to be able to, to process? And we select the process. And you're right, when, when there's a record of these things, it can be hard to pick through and, and know how to, how to adjudge a person's stance at a given moment. That's, that's interesting. Um, a couple other questions here that, that sort of circle around this. Um, speaking as, as someone familiar with the Japanese and Australian university contexts, it sometimes appears like universities are not doing enough to protect or to speak out for Chinese students or academics from CCP regime threats or from arbitrary arrest when they return home. In the UK or the US, are leading universities working out procedures for addressing such cases and taking a stronger line against regime threats to Chinese academics and students abroad? Um, no, I think that's an excellent point. And I think that also is the part of the question that should have been part of my answer to the first question is that in addition to providing that you know relative safe space uh, or thoughtful safe space um is is also to think of ways to support the students when they face threats right like they should have a place where they can report they should have a place where they can say oh i don't feel so comfortable and um, again going back to the student i was talking about who studies in a university in the east coast so i ask well why don't you say something about this orientation being organized with CSSA? She's like, but to whom? Um, and how would I know they're not going to forward my email directly to the CSSA, in which case I'd be doomed. Um, I think, you know, the universities, um, again, I have not surveyed the tens of thousands of universities around the world, it would be a bit hard to say, but it is my impression that there hasn't really been like an ombudsman of an office where people are given the impression that there is confidentiality, yeah. where they can submit. What, what happens if the police is coming to visit my family because of what I said in class? Like, who would these students go to? It would be convoluted for them to seek any kind of justice. and. Um, or to seek any support. So having that kind of monitoring mechanisms where the universities um, quite, you know, actively provide a kind of ombudsman service or report monitoring um, and having to report on um, or, or, you know, government requiring that um, there should be some transparency in funding from other um, from from authoritarian governments. Uh, are some of the recommendations that we actually have in the code of conduct. Um, I believe that our colleagues in Australia actually have been have pushed for a law that has some kind of these protections in place. So uh, um, uh, that may make the situation better. But um, I actually, you know, the situation here in the US is very different. Um, I don't think the federal government would be at any time uh, soon we'll be legislating on just what, um, you know, how to maintain academic freedom on, on campus. Um, so there are different realities on the, on the ground. And then here, um, the powers are a lot more diffuse vested in university administrators mm -hmm. um, to do the right thing. And, and unfortunately, sometimes, um, like I said, the administrators often don't feel they want to do this because they themselves have to, um, again, you know, perhaps speaking to, about them with, without, um, I hope they can, if any administrators is on the call, um, it would be good to hear from their perspective because it's my impression that the interest lies in maintaining exchanges, relationships with universities in China, rather than protecting the Chinese students who come on campus. Um, or, or at least, you know, that is not often with, attached with equal importance. Maybe that's not fair, but on the other hand, um, I think a lot of Chinese students feel scared and lonely. And I think it would be, um, is it the service to them that they made it to come to the US to study, that they cannot enjoy the same freedoms that other people in this country have? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, you, oh man, you nailed it when you said that it's a diffuse, I mean, it's a devilish problem, how to, how to provide solutions to problems that a variety of campuses are facing, but solutions that can be generally applicable because the situation, the context is always local. It's always dependent on the, on the individuals and how university structures are set up and relationships with local police forces and with state governments. Uh, it's, it's 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 really it's really really challenging. Um, shifting gears to to talk a bit more about scholars for for a moment and, and and teachers. Someone's asking here, how can I express my concerns about CCP influence in my university without being accused of xenophobia? 
On the other hand, is there a chance that I could be monitored by students in my classroom? Um, well, I, I, I think there is a chance if there are students from uh, China and you're speaking about China, but on the other hand, um, to me, uh, speaking out has risk. Um, and, and we are fortunate to be living in a time in history and a part of, of this particular globe that relatively are safe, but you know, as we have talked about, there are, uh, there are problems. And, but we should not forget that being able to speak freely has been, I think, a historic anomaly, perhaps. Um, not a historian, but let's just say we're very lucky. Um, so um, speaking out has risk, and I would not just because if you are not from China, if you're from China, then it's a different matter. If you're not from China, the fact that you're monitored by the Chinese government, um, I would not worry about that, right? But if you are a scholar on China and does want to go to China, that's why a lot of Chinese scholars more or less try to stay a bit quieter. I mean, this is a broad brush. Some Chinese scholars, some scholars who work on China do speak out and quite forcefully. Um, but I think the idea of self-censorship is pretty much, uh, is quite strong um, among that, among the community. Um, so if you are, so that, that I think that answers um, part of that uh, question. Um, sorry, I don't remember the, the rest of the, the, the question apart from whether or not someone is being monitored by the Chinese government. Uh, I think I think it, it also wondering, uh, to your point about what university processes are in place, um, how, what, how can we, faculty, uh, report mm -hmm. suspicions or concerns about CCC yeah. presence on campus, uh, in their classroom even? Um, you were saying, who do you turn to? So I guess the question is, who do you turn to, right? <laughs> what resources are there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know enough about like, um, what if your administrators have not set up these processes? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what motivates them not to do that. Um, it could just be out of pure busyness, like it's not a group they think very much about, right? Sure, There's sure. so many other things to worry about. Um, it could be the kind of thing where you feel comfortable bringing it up to administrators because of, you know, actual harassment that take place concerning the students. Um, I would also suggest perhaps seeking out students who are political minorities and in, in, uh, mm -hmm. minorities of all kinds, right? Tibetans, the Uyghurs, the Hong Kong people, the political, uh, politically uh, active students from China who hold different views but wouldn't want to say. I, I think it takes a bit of time to find, find those, but um, if you have, if you, if you have them with you, I think that makes a significant group to also um, take away the consideration of being accused of xenophobic. Because I mean, like I said, I mean, these are all Asian students. Um, they can say what, how they feel um, if, if they are they're comfortable of, yeah. So make, make, I think make those alliances, try to, again, I would encourage you to take a look at our code of conduct and uh, which does not seem to be costly at all in my opinion, um, but to bring those to the administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's great advice. Thinking about um, coalition building and relationship building is, is, is important here. Um, this is an interesting one. How serious are the challenges facing joint venture universities such as NYU Shanghai and Duke Kunshan University? Is meaningful academic freedom still possible? Presumably the question is, is it, still possible at these joint ventures where there's sort of co-ownership of, of the campus and the content? Um, I'm not convinced that is possible on the campus in China. That's just, I, I don't know what the universities would themselves say. I would imagine they would say, oh, we have these safeguards. We've thought about this. We actually have a lot of freedom. Um, I don't believe that. I don't believe you can have a conversation about say Uyghurs oppression on the campus in Shanghai um, mm -hmm. freely without fear. Um, you could, you may be able to push the boundaries, but like your students could be questioned by the police. Is that's not free? And so yes, I don't think those joint ventures from the very beginning would work in terms of if the pursuit is academic freedom. If the pursuit is something else, which I think is often the case, then that's what motivates the the. The joint ventures. Sure, sure, sure. 
Uh, cool. So I want to ask sort of the juicy, one of the big juicy questions here that that's been sort of hanging around our, our chat. Um, I guess there's, there's sort of two parts to this question. Part one is where do you see the Chinese intellectual climate heading in the coming decades? Uh, what, what, what do you, what do you predict is, is we're going to see more of, and is the U S on, on a shared timeline? I mean, there's, there's some debate even in our questions here tonight about how bad it is in the US. Um, on the one hand, it's arguable that although our challenges are incredibly real, that we do have scholars who are losing their livelihoods for saying things on Twitter, uh, that it's not the same as being chased by the state. And there's some debate in, in the questions here that it's in some ways worse in the US where um, the 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 demands are poisoning our intellectual work, the demands to respond to certain DEI initiatives or ideologies, uh, the desire to push ideologies into mathematics or physics where some people believe they don't belong, that this, this, there's an insidiousness to it. So just what's, what's your diagnosis of the US culture as it compares to the Chinese, Chinese one? And you know, relatively speaking, how far along are both cultures to a fascist regime? <laughs> um, I would say that in Ch China is in a very bleak place. Um, and that is not good for anyone. Um, particularly, I think the country is um, have a very strong sense of being aggrieved historically, that it is a great mm -hmm. nation, it was a great nation that had um, lost its uh, place, and it is now on the way to rejuvenate. Now, obviously, every nation can think and, and, and of course, rejuvenate the, the, the nation, that's not a problem, but the problem appears um, to be that it considers that rejuvenation as um, as a pretty zero sum situation. Um, that's, um, mm -hmm. uh, and that means we are in a difficult, turbulent, and very scary time. Um, there's no way to say that to offer any silver lining at all when it comes to China. Sure. Um, and I think that is also part and parcel of growing authoritarianism across the world. We're talking about, you know, um, the, the, um, uh, leaders like Duterte um, in the Philippines um, or um, in the US, we are seeing voting rights also uh, being threatened um, uh, in various places in this country. Um, so in that, in that way, um, this time in history is a difficult and dangerous one. Um, but at the same time, um, I also think that democratic societies are different. Um, and that they are so much more pluralistic and so much more diverse that they have built into them, as long as you don't take away the buildings, um, these um, structures for resilient. Um, people are meant to, set, meant to be very different. States are meant to be very different. They are meant to have these kind of ways and mechanisms to resolve conflict. Um, of course, I'm not a specialist in the US and maybe my optimism is somewhat display, misplaced. Um, but, um, and, and of course, and, and, and one has to really guard against authoritarianism in many different forms. Um, but um, I also have the hope that it, at least in this country, um, pluralism and decentralization are virtuals. Um, I know it all looks sometimes very chaotic. It all looks very, um, at, at times there are a lot of ex excesses. Um, but at the same time, I also think that is not like in China where these things you thought existed, at least for a while, you you know, the Chinese government talked about the rule of law and there were some laws being put in place, but none of these would, were actually you know, they crumbled like dominoes, right? Like okay, the, the COVID controls, much of it is illegal. Um, but um, in this country, I do think laws and regulations matter and people and institutions have you know, stood, um, will stand the test of time. But of course, you, I think there are a lot of problems, everything from the use of surveillance by the government and to, um, you know, threats to uh, 
that many different things um, are going to um, make some of these a big challenge for this country. So I would say, again, the US has been lucky in time and space, um, but I'm not sure if you don't protect it, what will happen. Sure. But, but I think I would be, I don't have the crystal ball for the US. I have to, I feel like I know <laughs> China, where China is going and it's not good. At least I can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, 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 uh, you, you put your finger on an interesting strand that HXA has been been following this past year. I mean, we we open our academic year with a conversation with Jonathan Rausch, whose book Constitution of Knowledge points to uh, a part of what you're saying here that um, we we need to preserve that plurality. We need to preserve the the. Uh, he kind of he kind of goes against the notion that that it, it's about a free market. We need to establish and maintain, much like the founders of the of the of the U.S. did, uh, checks and balances to ensure that right. um, that plurality thrives and that all ideas and all questions are are on the table. And just recently, you might be aware, uh, Jonathan Haidt wrote that piece for the Atlantic um, about why the last ten years have been so uniquely stupid is a word that he used. And he goes after social media and he makes several points that, that I think uh, transect this, that, that uh, the rise specifically of retweeting and the viral tweet and liking tamps down on that plurality, tamps down on the ability to sort of uh, engage widely with things, mm -hmm. but it, it also hurts our ability to, to have a common good, a common shared culture that can be a through line through that plurality as as well. And I, I mean, my heart grieves for, for Chinese students and scholars who are in this country who feel like they can't participate in that, uh, can't be vocal and open and authentic in the things that they're thinking and asking. Um, so, you know, I mean, thank you for that. Thank you for raising uh, uh, a warning flag that we have something good here and it's, it's worth preserving. Um, yeah. 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 And um, I mean, part of my other portfolio is actually on working on technology and particularly on China. Oh, and I can oh. say that um, technology platforms that we are speaking through, uh, particularly Twitter and uh, TikTok and so on, uh, are structured in ways that are div divisiveness makes money, right? Sure. Or makes makes the clicks and, and uh, you know, viewership. And that has a very, um, perhaps quite a damaging effect on, on democracy. So um, again, these new threats to democracy keeps coming up and it is, um, I think important to identify them even though they might not look like they are, right? Like the idea that we can express ourselves on, on Twitter, sure. But is, the, is that structure of interaction something beneficial for open inquiry? I think it's a, it's a different matter. Yeah, absolutely. So there's actually, there's a great question related to this. Uh, someone just asked, um, more than 10 years ago, a Chinese student told me that all young people in China know how to evade internet restrictions. The phrase Tibet independence cannot appear on Chinese social media, but Tibet independence with, with two eyes in, in uh, the word Tibet can. Is this still true? And more broadly speaking, uh, what is the state of internet freedoms in China today? Uh, I'm curious to hear from you. It, is, 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 Chinese restriction is still something that, 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 that you know that the youth can hack. And uh, what are you seeing there? Well, hacking has its uh, limits. Uh, if um, you are essentially against a very weaponized <laughs> opponent, no. right? Where um, I used to joke about how the idea is that people can scale the Great Firewall. I'm sure you've heard of the expression mm -hmm. here. It's the Great Firewall of China. Mm -hmm. And then people use the VPN to scale it so that they can see it outside. Uh, the wall has gone higher and higher and higher. The holes have been patched. And, and now you would have to have five different letters. And, and who has that? <laughs> or who knows how to put them all together in a way that doesn't crumble down and, and, and kill you is a, is a great, um, it, it means that. Yes, people can get around that um, these restrictions if they are so determined, but not many people are, and um, mm. and that is a problem. Is that um, of course often I think change comes from a minority. Often is um, in in many kind of situations, revolutions and otherwise. Um, so so we shouldn't be losing hope that only a small minority of people are determined to do so. But on the other hand, uh, we are talking about a very powerful um, government. Um, but all of these are influx. So in other words, um, 
let's say some incident to make people very, very angry. And uh, maybe things will spread like wildfire. But I think the Chinese government has made sure that these kind of things just don't happen, or they have enough resources to deal with outpouring of anger. Um, but again, you know, um, things haven't happened yet, doesn't mean that they won't happen. And uh, it is my hope that somehow, somewhere in the equation, one way tips to another side that um, um, in, in, that would be heavy enough to tip the, the balance. But it would be really, one side would have to really add up to, to tip that balance. Sure, sure. So this is recorded and is going to live on, on YouTube. Um, if there is a Chinese scholar or student listening to this right now uh, in the US, what would you say to them? Um, I would say that I'm glad that they're here to, uh, to um, attend a, a conversation on a topic. Um, and I hope that they would reach out to tell us whether or not they think these measures or these um, that would protect um, safe space for Chinese students and scholars are adequate. Um, hmm. And I would hope that they would give some suggestions about how do we um, do that uh, going forward, uh, both in China and outside of, of China. Yeah. Um, and I would hope that, um, that they understand that this moment in time that looks really difficult is not forever. Um, and that life can change in a second. Um, and that if they do something um, that even just help a little, maybe that would help bring about some lasting change. Hmm. Yeah, those are, those are great words. I, I wanna um, stay on that for just a moment. Uh, th there's a question here about are some majors in intellectual subjects more likely to end up in the crosshairs than, than others? And you spoke to that a little bit earlier about uh, students choosing more technical uh, subjects because it's because it's safer. Uh, again, to, to whoever might be listening to this now or, or later who is just passionate about a particular subject, wants to ask certain questions and is, is having trouble with fear, suspicion, uh, risk, what would you say to them as well? I mean, there's so many options. Take the safe route, take the safe route now until it's safer, uh, find other ways to, to, to ask your questions. Uh, what, what, what have you seen be successful for, for people in this country who, who want to try to push, push past that fear, uh, even at personal risk? Hmm. Um, well, I think, you know, a lot of people, um, it depends. So, so some people do choose safe subjects, and and you know, I think the idea of safe has a spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, I think a lot of people are not completely risk averse, but they choose kind of what we call kind of um, like ping pong or whatever. Like you, you're not you're not hitting the subject, but you are hitting the side, sure. <laughs> and. Um, Again, I don't play ping pong actually, so I, I don't know if that's more. <laughs> <Maybe there's laughs> <no help here. laughs> there's a Chinese word for it. But, but anyway, you, you kind of strike at the sides and that, that still kind of serves, maybe serves the ball, but it's not quite, you know, you're not in the middle of it. Um, so there are plenty of people doing that, I know, um, and, and they hope for the best and they try to inspire the students um, and, you um, so, so it could be that uh, scholars are studying freedom of expression in China, but they are picking a topic that has to do with statistical analysis rather than, you know, um, trying to study dissidents and activists. So that computational science statistical analysis of WeChat is a kind of generally safe topic. But, um, and then some people try to um, push the boundaries a bit more and, and, and go to more sensitive areas, but then they may be, um, you know, using pseudonym. It, it's not great, and I don't know, um, or, um, or, or trying to protect themselves in, in other ways um, that, or they could be, you know, researching, but they're contributing their time volunteering for researching areas or contributing tips and, and work to organizations that do human rights work. I think all are options on the table. Um, so it's not, it's not just stick your head out 
or have it cut off and then don't say anything at all. I think they are not the only two options and people are creative um, in those ways. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. I, I think I think that in US culture as well, uh, I've spoken to so many faculty who are facing fears because they're the, they're the only person on their campus or in their department who, who at least they believe, who believes a certain thing. Uh, I, I was one of those. Um, and it often feels like that, Maya. It often feels like the only two choices are to just put your head down or find that moment to just, just put it all out there. And sometimes either of those choices is, is absolutely legitimate, but you make a great point about the vast, uh, I was gonna say gray area, but it's more like vast uh, set of steps that lead from one of these to the other. And taking small, small steps uh, as befits the moment, the day, the situation uh, can be huge. It can be huge for, for building your own courage, uh, for testing the waters and, and, and for also modeling and helping those around you. Um, so that, that, right. that's Yeah. And I think modeling and helping others around you is an important one where um, I think um, part of you know, how authoritarianism works is to essentially cut off people's horizontal knowledge of each other. Um, you mm -hmm. don't know whether or not the person sitting next to you is actually thinking the same way, but you are both pretending to be otherwise because that would be the safer way of going about things. Sure. Um, in, in a democratic society, I think things are somewhat different perhaps, but maybe, maybe in some environments, people are also afraid of talking. Um, and, and I think, you know, anyone who can push a little bit for other people to step together, that is um, a contribution often enough um, for that, uh, for now, because, you know, there are different times, uh, different risks. Um, right now, I think it's very repressive for, for Chinese students and scholars. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe later on, it would be, it would be different. So um, I think in my in my work, I come across a lot of different people who are doing that, but they just not kind of banging their drums and, and as, um, but they, sure. they contribute in their own little ways. Yeah, 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 that's great. I, my, I have so many more questions for you, but that's such a beautiful uh, place to end end this. I think uh, I, I hope that that people listening now and later have uh, some some hope and some 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 encouragement here as as we wrap up. Uh, Maya, thank you so much for joining us. Your your knowledge of these issues is is deep and tremendous, and we all benefited from it immensely. So we appreciate you being here. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you for um, attending this uh, conversation. And if you do have any kind of concern or interest and want to discuss the code of conduct, uh, very much welcome that you get in touch. And thanks for ha um, having me and this opportunity. Thanks so much. All right, be well. Thank you.